Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first public engagement lecture from the Fac Faculty of Medical Sciences here at University College London. Thank you for joining in. And the producer told me just before we start, we have over 350 people tuned in and probably more will join us. So it's great to have you all on board. Normally, we would have liked to welcome you to one of our lecture theatres, but under the current circumstances, this is the best we can do, a live webinar, which will be recorded for your further information and will be sent to you afterwards. Um, the advantage of the live webinar is that a lot of you can join in from where you are, so stay with us till the end. We will send you a feedback form towards the end of the presentation as well, so we would appreciate your feedback on that and also we selected the, the topic for the first lecture around uh, um, um, COVID-19 which is affecting a lot of our friends and family or someone that we know so it's a hot topic at the moment but moving forward you could help us select the, the future talks the presentation the titles so do feedback to us. My name is Dr. Zara Mori and I'm from the Division of uh, Surgery and Interventional Science one of the module leads in the medical sciences and engineering degree program. And it brings me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Mervyn Singer. Thank you, Mervyn, for joining us, joining us today. The title of his talk tells it all, so I don't need to read it again, but I just would like to tell you he is a professor of intensive care medicine at UCL, and he is the chair of the International Sepsis Forum. He has written a number of textbooks around critical care, so do look out for them and read them if it's the area that you're interested in. And his area of expertise and interest in terms of research is to take the medical innovations from the lab to the bed, so from the bench to the bedside, from the lab and the laboratory environment to actually helping the patients in the hospitals. So um, with, without any further ado, I'll pass on my um, virtual microphone to you, Mervyn, and thank you for joining us in. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Zara. I'm just going to hopefully get my talk up and uh, running. So, sorry about the delay. Right. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. Hi, uh, my name's Mervyn Singer and it's a great pleasure to chat to you today. So uh, I'll talk for about 20 minutes or so and then uh, please feel free to ask questions and I'll try my best to answer them. So, um, COVID is in the news, uh, it has been for the last few months, so I'll talk about something that we did at UCL and at University College Hospital. Um, COVID um, is a horrible disease and the likes of which we'd not seen before, so the way it attacks the body was completely different. And so there was very much a learning curve as to how to manage these patients. And you can see these are chest X-rays that came from China and you can see the the lungs usually appear as black on an x-ray and you can see day by day there's increased fluffiness which is indicative of a severe inflammatory response in the lungs and many of the patients in Wuhan initially and then in Italy and it then traveled uh, to Spain, UK etc suffered a severe drop in oxygen levels in their blood which needed them to become hospitalized and about 15 percent of these patients couldn't cope with just an oxygen mask alone it wasn't sufficient to get enough oxygen into their bloodstream so they needed more respiratory support and the traditional way of doing that is to use a ventilator so this is where the patient is heavily sedated, paralyzed, and then a tube is put through the mouth into the trachea, the windpipe, and that's then connected to a, a bellows, a, a mechanical ventilator that pushes air in and out. The problem was in Wuhan, and then it got replicated in, in Italy, was that there, there was a, such a sudden rush of these critically ill patients that it overwhelmed the resources available, the critical care resources and the ventilator resource. We had a bit of warning in the UK. Um, so the first 100 confirmed cases were reported from China on the 20th of January, Italy towards the middle end of February, 
and the UK around the 6th, 7th of March. So we had a little bit of time to prepare. Unfortunately, I think it's fair to say we were a bit slow to react and we didn't actually take on board the lessons that China and Italy had learned the hard way. This is a, a oops, sorry, I'll, there's a little clip I'll show you which came from a BBC television series in the 1980s called Yes Minister and I hope the sound carries through. In stage one we say nothing is going to happen. Stage two we say something may be going to happen but we should do nothing about it. On stage three we say that maybe we should do something about it but there's nothing we can do. <laughs> stage four we say maybe there was something we could have done but it's too late now. <laughs> So unfortunately, uh, I think that was a bit of the story of what happened in the UK and um, the penny dropped at least publicly on the 13th of March when Boris Johnson announced that there would be unfortunately many, many deaths in the UK and that's unfortunately been borne out. And then in the next few days, television and, and newspaper headlines kept appearing. You know, the modelling suggested huge numbers of patients would end up in hospitals in the United Kingdom and because of the lack of critical care beds there may have to be rationing. Unfortunately in terms of resource the United Kingdom lags behind other developed countries in the number of critical care beds we have so you can see compared to the United States which has about 35 we have 6.6 so in total in the UK there's about three and a half thousand intensive care beds and by using anaesthetic machines, borrowing ventilators from the private sector, the capacity could be increased up to about 8,000. However, the modelling suggested we would need potentially up to 40,000 ventilators. Yet, as you can imagine, the whole world was crying out for ventilators and there was a worldwide shortage, they weren't available. And we were starting to get these reports from Italy about the terrible situation that they were facing. And you can see here in the top right corner a picture of patients not on ventilators, but having what's called non-invasive respiratory support. So the patients are awake and they're breathing in, as shown here in these hoods, these helmets. They're called bubble CPAP. And what do I mean by CPAP? CPAP stands for continuous positive airways pressure. So in patients in whom an oxygen mask isn't good enough, but perhaps you don't want to fully ventilate them, it offers a nice halfway house. And this positive pressure splints the lungs open and improves oxygenation of the blood and that obviously helps the body get more oxygen. So the positive pressure without the CPAP, you know, you the alveoli, the bases of the lungs collapse down, but with CPAP it splints the alveoli, alveoli open and it helps the, the matching of blood flowing through the lungs and its ability to pick up oxygen. And so, the patient wears a tight fitting mask and an air oxygen mix is passed through at very high flow across the mask and the patient breathes out through a valve and this valve, what's called a PEEP valve, allows the patient to breathe out against a resistance. So rather than breathing out against atmospheric pressure, there's a little bit of positive pressure that keeps the lungs splinted open. And the masks that the patient can wear can either be a tight mask covering the nose and mouth, one over the nose, a whole face mask or this bubble helmet hood type of approach. So it's sealed to allow a good flow of air under pressure. However, CPAP, there was a lot of worry about CPAP the World Health Organization, many national guidelines, including the UK, because of the fear of transmission of the COVID virus through aerosolization because of the high flow and therefore a risk to healthcare workers. However, needs must, and despite these guidelines, doctors in China and Italy had turned to CPAP 
because they didn't have the ventilators, they didn't have the intensive care beds, and they wanted to spare these for the most needy. And this is an example of a, a guideline from Italy, and you don't have to know Italian to see the word CPAP there. So it, it figured quite prominently in their guideline. And a friend of mine who was one of the leaders of the emergency response in the Lombardy region, that's around Milan, he told me in early March, I don't have any hard data, but I'm absolutely sure CPAP is the answer. And I have many friends and colleagues in China and Italy, and they said that about 30 to 70 percent of patients managed with CPAP could be kept off a ventilator, thus reserving that resource for those who really, really needed it. Importantly, there were no reports of serious infection in healthcare workers, doctors, nurses caring for these patients. Yes, we were wearing PPE and they were wearing PPE, but these patients weren't ending up as intensive care patients themselves. And there were no issues with oxygen supply because they use more oxygen than a standard oxygen mask, but the hospitals were coping. So at University College Hospital and with the buy-in of frontline doctors, the nursing staff, the hospital management, we started from the very beginning to use CPAP to try and spare intensive care beds and ventilators for those who really needed it. And that wasn't what the, uh, the Department of Health were recommending at the time, but we thought the lessons from Italy and China were so compelling, this made sense to us. And we developed an algorithm. So commencing at the front door of the hospital, the emergency department, we assessed whether the patients needed CPAP or not. There was this rapid intensive training program for patients outside intensive care to learn how to use CPAP, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists and so forth. And we looked to buy more machines. We only had 12 standalone machines in the whole hospital and we were anticipating many, many more patients. However, none were available, so we had a problem. So I'd now like to talk to you about our little uh, CPAP project and the journey we went on. So as I mentioned earlier, by early March, we'd identified that we needed more CPAP devices to help our patients and the projected need. On the 16th of March, Boris Johnson announced that he was asking UK industry to help make ventilators. There was a shortfall of about 30,000 ventilators. So he appealed to companies, Dyson, Rolls-Royce, Airbus, big companies to make ventilators to try and fill the gap. In my humble view, this was completely misguided for two reasons. Firstly, these are very sophisticated machines and to ask companies who had no experience in making ventilators to make them from scratch in a few weeks was an impossibility. These machines take months, years to develop. So to get it done in weeks would be, to my mind anyway, an impossible ask. And secondly, with the anticipated rush of patients, there wouldn't be the beds, the intensive care staff who could look after mechanically ventilated patients. You do need special training because without that, that can endanger the patient's lives. So I had a thought that, well, can we make CPAP machines? And there was this very old device that had been invented by a small company in Britain in the early 1990s called the Whisperflow. And it was a purely mechanical device with three knobs. There was an on off button. There was a button to adjust how much oxygen was coming from the wall oxygen supply and also a button to adjust the flow rate. And that's all there was to it. Purely mechanical, no electrical bits, no moving parts, a very simple device. It was no longer being made. It actually had come out of patent we found a few months later, so we were free to copy it. As I mentioned, it was simple to make, but it's simple to operate too, so it doesn't need much in the way of training. And because it was based on an existing device, hopefully 
it would be easy to get regulatory approval because clearly you can't use something that you make in your garden shed and then try it on patients. You have to make sure it's not going to harm the patient. So it's simpler to make, but clearly important questions. Could it be made quickly and at scale for the thousands of patients who would potentially need it? And we had the other added problem of a global lockdown. So many factories were now closing. So Boris Johnson announced his uh, request for ventilators to be built on the 17th of March, on the 16th, and some of our engineers at UCL were asked to help with uh, forming consortia. And the two people shown here, Professor Becky Shipley, who's the Professor of Healthcare Engineering at UCL, and Professor Tim Baker, who's a Professor of Mechanical Engineering, they asked me about this and I gave them my views that no, we didn't need ventilators. We needed the CPAP device devices. And uh, we met um, the day before the senior common room at University College London was locked down and we talked about what we needed. So that was the 17th of March. Let's see if we can make it. How are we going to make it at scale? Enter Mercedes Formula One racing team. So Tim, the professor of mechanical engineering in an earlier life, had worked designing and building engines for Formula One teams. And so he had many strong connections, one of whom was the chief engineer at Mercedes AMG HPP, the high performance powertrains factory in Northamptonshire that made the engines for Formula One cars. And this is a big factory, 800 people work there, really skilled engineers and technicians. And you can see there right at the front, the guy on the right, you might recognize somebody called Lewis Hamilton. And the guy next to him is the managing director, who's also an engineer called Andy Cowell. So Andy was contacted that evening, can Mercedes help? And his answer was an immediate yes. So the following day, he dispatched four of his top engineers down to UCL to work with the engineers there. And they were amazing. You know, they did CT scans of the whisper flow. They found one themselves on eBay. There were computer aided designs. They looked at the flow through the machine and they built some prototypes. So you can see here from blocks of steel, they engineered precision engineered them. And you can see here how beautifully made they were. And this was the final product. And they did this in just 100 hours after our first meeting on the 17th of March. Amazing speed. So in naught to 100 hours from the original, we found one in our hospital museum. They found one on eBay to this device. And it even had a UCL uh, logo imprinted on it. So they brought it up to me on the Saturday. So we first talked about this on the Tuesday. They brought it up on the Saturday and there I am holding the very first prototype. And what do you do when you get a new toy? You want to try it. So here it is with me trying it out and it worked. And there's Andy Cowell. He came up with his chief engineer and you can see him there fiddling with the flow rate. So very, very rapid achievement. As I mentioned before, we had to get regulatory approval and the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency were incredibly helpful. So you can see here on the 20th of March, Neil McGuire said he's very happy to help. On the 25th of March, we sent in a huge dossier with all the technical spec, the manufacturing. I tested it with some colleagues on ourselves, so we had some validation data. And you can see that we were given approval to use it on the 27th of March. So the MHRA responded in just 36 hours. Oopsie daisy, sorry, going back too fast. So that was the 27th of March and then the UCL comms team went into action and the BBC were really keen to highlight this. And Fergus Walsh, the medical correspondent, came and filmed on the, 20, on the 27th of March. He cut it over the weekend 
and it was announced on the BBC website. And I'll play you a little bit of uh, BBC Breakfast. He delivers oxygen to the lungs without the need for a ventilator. Here's our medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh. It's a small device that could make a big difference. Known as continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP, it pushes oxygen into the lungs, keeping them open, making it easier to breathe. They're already used in the NHS, but are in short supply. So a team modified and improved an existing design in less than a week, which has now been approved for use by health regulators. And this story went global. So you can see all over the world, uh, people were really interested in what we'd done and uh, they were interested to hear more. So it was uh, quite a, a busy time, as you can imagine. We even had the ultimate accolades, you know, tweets from Gary Lineker and Lewis Hamilton. What more could you ask for? And Mercedes, just to show how impressive they were, so we then were asked by the UK government to build 10,000 of these. And by the 15th of April, less than a month from when we first sat down and had the idea, they produced 10,000 devices, which is quite a remarkable feat. And uh, I'm full of admiration for them. And actually, I, I won't go into the detail now, but they, together with our engineers, improved on the design. And so a, a Mark II device came out as the 10,000 devices, which was actually up to 70% more efficient in oxygen use than the original device. Let's go back a step two. The other thing we thought was really, really, really important was not just to look after the UK, but to think about the rest of the world, because clearly um, everywhere else has been suffering from COVID and many countries aren't as rich and developed as the UK. So what we did was on the 6th of April, we made the designs freely available for anyone in the world. So anyone in the world could access the designs, the manufacturing package, what materials were used. We had training videos, educational brochures, etc. And provided you were a legitimate organization, a government, a healthcare provider, a research institution, a manufacturer, you could have the designs. And in fact, we gave over 1800 uh, design packages to different groups. And so far, 105 countries have expressed interest and the devices are now being made locally, being donated or being purchased at cost. So we don't want to make any profit from this to loads and loads of countries around the world where they're being used. I'd just like to finish off by thanking, I mentioned Becky and Tim earlier, my lovely colleague, another intensive care consultant, Dr. David Brearley, here wearing a mask, who was also hugely instrumental in helping me with getting the clinical evaluations done and helping the engineers optimise the device. And the other gentleman is Professor David Lomas, who is the vice provost of the university. He's a, a respiratory physician as well. And so he immediately saw the need for the device and helped open doors, not only in UCL to get the funding streams and the bureaucracy swept away, but also with government and the Department of Health. And I'd also just briefly like to acknowledge the many, many other people in UCL, the engineers, Mercedes, everyone who made this possible. On that note, thank you very much indeed for listening and I'll hand you back to Zara. Thank you. You unmute yourself, Zara. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Mervyn. That was really interesting. I have read about this stuff on the uh, University UCL's website, but I really wanted to hear it from somebody who was in the front line. Um, really interesting to hear about CPAP, how it went from the sort of from the labs of the engineers to the actual patients in the hospital. And the fact that you mentioned the collaboration between various departments, between engineers, your colleagues in the hospital, between uh, Professor Shipley and Professor Breaker, that's amazing. That just to show to our young audience the, uh, 
you know, uh, students of the high school that this is the, the future of the research and the future of the world, that we all collaborate together. There's a large number of questions, obviously, and I must tell the audience, we've got, the producer told me, we've got over 800 of you tuned in, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm now under pressure to try to choose some of those questions and read out to you. So uh, I'll try not to repeat, and I'm, I've tried to, we kind of, with my colleagues, we're trying to put them into groups so that we follow, you know, the same type of questions rather than jumping. That clip from Yes Minister was really funny, so that's great. There's a lot of questions around that from the from the audience, obviously, around the reactions of the of the government about this event. And there's a few questions around the actual virus. And um, so I think maybe I'll start with the virus itself. So what are your opinions, uh, Professor Singer, in terms of uh, how this this virus differs from the previous ones that we've come across in many years back, SARS, etc.? How does it this one differ? is different compared to the previous so i think um it, it caused so sars uh, was something that happened um, at about 2002 to 2004 and the patients there had severe respiratory symptoms but they presented quite quickly with covid because it takes about five days or so for the patient to become symptomatic um, it meant it could be very easily spread without often people realising that they were transmitting viruses. And then it took a further five days from the patients becoming symptomatic to pitching up in hospital and needing to be admitted. And so there was this long run in period. And again, many patients had relatively mild symptoms or even no symptoms. And uh, unfortunately, a proportion were very very severely affected and you know one of the things that i think has shocked the medical community at how different it is from other viral pneumonias it does behave differently and so we had to learn how to manage it very quickly yes uh, i agree with you i've heard that from other colleagues who work in the hospitals um, what about you know we hear that viruses can mutate very rapidly yeah. So do you think a mutated strain would have the same severity? What's your thoughts on that? Well, mutation can uh, basically go in either direction. It might either become mild or it can even go away or it may potentially become more severe. So we talked about SARS. SARS essentially disappeared after 2004. We, we don't know why, but it came affected a few big cities like Toronto, Singapore, Hong Kong, and then went away. So hopefully it will be the same for COVID, but unfortunately there's no guarantee. It may come back with a vengeance in the next few weeks, months, years, or a mutated COVID or a completely new virus may also unfortunately hit the planet. Sure, um, I think I've I agree on that with you as a, we, we don't know how the virus is going to respond, which way it's going to go. We hope it's going to go to the milder version that we can then cope with better. Um, how about your thoughts on herd immunity? What are your ideas on that? Well, again, in the normal process, there are lots of uh, viruses like measles, mumps, chicken pox, where the idea is that immunity is gained across the population. So if there is an outbreak, most people are already immunized and you can achieve that through either lots of people catching it and then developing their own immunity or vaccination. So what the government are busy working on in many countries around the world, there are two vaccine trials going on in the UK, are trying to develop vaccines to try and improve herd immunity. So clearly, we hope it will work, there's no guarantee, and maybe even if it doesn't work fully, it may modify the symptoms so that the patients may get COVID infection, but they won't get it to the severe degree that we've been seeing in the last few months. Great. So you mentioned the vaccine and some sort of a, you know, antiviral drug. Um, so a member of the audience is asking what is specifically about the structure, the molecular biology of the virus itself makes it so hard to develop a vaccine or an antiviral drug? Well, unfortunately, COVID-19 belongs to 
a group of viruses called coronaviruses. And the, the best known coronavirus is the common cold. And unfortunately, for 30, 40 years, people have tried to come up with vaccines against the common cold and have failed miserably the, for two reasons. A, the virus mutates and changes, but also even if you do get immunity, it seems to be relatively short lasting, a year, two years maximum. So by and large for coronaviruses, vaccines have not been shown to be terribly effective and not long lasting. So yes, if a vaccine is developed and clearly huge efforts are going into trying to do so, there may be the need to have repeat vaccinations every year. Right, so you've answered another question that uh, actually had asked, if we had a vaccine, how long would it, how long we would be immune to COVID-19 is the, in terms of the lifetime? So you've already covered that. I'm going to move on to another question in terms of the populations that get affected. Why is it that the elderly uh, get affected from a scientific? So an anonymous person is asking from a scientific point of view, why elderly are more prone to COVID-19? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, uh, the brutal answer is we don't know. Um, clearly people or certain groups, population groups have been identified at being at higher risk. So elderly men more so than women, black and Asian minority ethnic groups have been identified. People who have underlying diabetes, hypertension, heart failure. So all of these groups have been identified. The big, big, big question is why? Um, it may be that, you know, if you have underlying health care problems, if you're immunity is impaired to some degree. As you get older, your immunity changes. So the immune function of a 20 year old is very different from a 70 year old. So that might be important. People have queried vitamin D levels, environmental pollution, you know, humidity and cold weather at night. Lots and lots of theories are abounding, but unfortunately we, we still don't know the answer. Great. So again, you answered a couple of other questions about BMEs. Are they the only ones affected? Obviously, the audience can now hear uh, Professor Singer's answer. It's not just the BME. There are other, yeah. Uh, yeah. other other sectors have been affected as well. So it's not what we hear in the news. So there is is a variety and there is no real answer to who is going to get it or not. But there are certain certain groups of the population are more prone to it. So I was going to move into the CPAP. There is a question about the negative pressure in the room. Would the CPAP patient be kept in a negative pressure room to maximize airflow or are these rooms uh, limited in the hospital environment? Yeah, so they are limited in the hospital. So intensive care units, you can modify the flow because obviously if a patient is infectious, you don't want them coughing out uh, their bugs around the room or you can have other areas or rooms where the, the, the flow is in the opposite direction. So you've got somebody whose immunity is compromised, you know, a leukemia patient, for example, where you don't want them to catch bugs. So intensive care units are well equipped for this, but general wards aren't. So what we did was we found that our hospital and other hospitals did the same. We, we cohorted patients together. So we managed to look after CPAP patients in the operating theatre area and one of the wards which we turned into a, a respiratory high dependency unit and the staff looking after these patients wore PPE. The good thing was that Public Health England did environmental air sampling and they couldn't find virus circulating in the air in these patients. So the good news was it didn't seem to be aerosolizing at any greater risk to somebody wearing a, a straightforward oxygen mask. Um, so we were encouraged by that. And as I mentioned earlier, in Spain, Italy, France, UK, China, we haven't had reports of doctors, nurses looking after these patients ending up as patients themselves. Great, thank you, Mervyn. Could negative, so Elena's asking, could negative pressure ventilators such as the ones used during polio, early polio epidemic, could be used to uh, to help COVID patients? Yeah, 
That is a really nice question. Um, so just to give a little bit of a historical perspective, in the early 1950s, uh, before polio vaccines came along, there were outbreaks, epidemics of polio, and that caused paralysis of patients and it could paralyze their respiratory muscles so they couldn't breathe. Um, and in Copenhagen, you know, or even beforehand, they were using um, sort of iron lungs. So the patient sat in an iron, a rigid box, and instead of the air being pushed in, as I described now with a ventilator, here the air around the patient, there was a vacuum which sucked the air in the opposite direction, creating a negative pressure to make the lung expand from outside rather than air being pushed in from inside through the windpipe. Um, and there are, um, in fact, people are trying to look at, a relook at these devices. The only problem is that with COVID, especially early on, the patient taking a deep breath wasn't a problem. And, you know, these patients were taking sometimes massive tidal volumes, massive deep breaths, but they weren't still able to get the oxygen into their lungs. So when you and I breathe, we're breathing negatively. We're sucking the air in like a vacuum cleaner into our lungs. So adding a negative pressure ventilator to our already large negative pressure breaths probably wouldn't help and may potentially cause harm because if you overinflate the lungs just like a balloon you keep blowing 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 and then the lungs go pop and then the lungs can burst and so there's this balancing act between helping the patient but not overdoing it with your ventilation both negative and positive pressure ventilation to cause damage I think that's really interesting to hear. So that's what makes CPAP quite exciting. It, it does what you're actually explaining it to do. Uh, since we're still talking about patients and you know the hospital environment, someone's asking your thoughts on chloroquine, uh, hydroxychloroquine. What are your thoughts on those um, drugs? Yeah, sadly, um, lots and lots and lots of drugs have been used or put forward where the evidence wasn't that particularly strong and hydroxychloroquine was one very good example. There was a little bit of data in mice um, models of being given a virus, um, a little bit in malaria because obviously that's where the use is of hydroxychloroquine. It's a standard drug used for malaria and that was extrapolated to maybe it could work in uh, viral illnesses and so there was a lot of excitement. You'll remember um, President Trump uh, promoting it very vigorously. Um, personally, me, I never believed in it from the first um, and so we never actually used it in any of our patients and my um, view was vindicated because subsequently there have been large trials to show it doesn't work unfortunately. So it was an idea, lots of ideas have been put forward you may have heard on the news last week about low dose steroids being effective. So that was one idea. That's the first study that's actually been shown in a, a randomized controlled trial where patients either get the drug or don't get the drug to have a benefit. So at least we have something now that will help for every six patients ventilated, it will save one life, which is clearly a, a benefit. Great. And just continuing from what you said, are you aware of any research in UCL or perhaps you're involved in terms of finding new medications or support for COVID-19 now that we have a large number of patients and access to samples? Are you involved in anything? Could could you share a bit of that for us? Oh, um, there, we still understand fully the mechanisms, the the pathology of how the virus causes this exaggerated response within the body, especially affecting the lung. And there are loads and loads and loads and loads of treatments being suggested or being trialed. I was sent a list a couple of weeks ago with 132 different ideas, which is a lot. Um, and it's difficult to know which one will work, especially as we don't fully understand the disease. So we're doing it at UCH and like most hospitals around the world are participating in trials to try and see which of these ideas do work. 
at the same time we're actively doing research to try and understand the mechanisms by which it causes disease much better. For example, um, the inflammation caused by COVID seems to generate a, an exaggerated thrombosis response. So yes, we're used to seeing patients with blood clots in their arteries or their veins or what are called pulmonary emboli, blood clots in the lung, but the number we've seen with COVID is around six, seven, eight times higher than what we're usually used to. So again, the contribution of these blood clots to the disease process, we still don't know. But again, that's an avenue for research. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. Um, so how do you deal with the stress of tragic diseases, you know, the line of work you're at, obviously, you see a lot of things on a daily basis and with COVID-19 probably on a very sort of enlarged, uh, in, in a enlarged sort of factor, how do you deal with those uh, tragic, oh. I assume the question is probably from one of the young members of the audience. Yeah. Oh, it, it is hard, you know, I'm not, um, unfortunately, you know, you've seen on the television, I'm sure, all of the, um, 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 television clips and um, interviews of people who work in intensive care. So to give you an example, you know, uh, we have a 35 bedded intensive care unit, but many of these patients are, are relatively well, you know, they've had a big operation, we're just waiting for them to recover. So at any one time we'll have, you know, five to 10 very unwell patients and the others are unwell, but not to the same degree. With COVID at its peak, we had 62 really sick patients. So the scale of the severity and the number of patients was just something we'd never experienced before. So usually we have one nurse, trained intensive care nurse to one patient who's very unwell. With COVID in our hospital, we had one trained nurse to four patients. Some hospitals in London, it was one trained intensive care nurse to six patients. So it put a huge strain on the hospital system. Yes, we had lots of support from the anaesthetic department, from the respiratory department, other doctors who were not intensive care doctors came to support us, but it, it was very, very stressful. And wearing that PPE is horrible. You get hot, you get sweaty, you can't hear uh, people talk to you and it takes a long time to put on and put off and um, and obviously there was this hidden fear of perhaps I might catch this horrible disease myself. So you had all of these stressful factors all combined at once, especially in dealing with a disease we'd never come across before. Yes, and for that reason, I thank you once again with those claps that we did on the Thursday. Originally, it was Wednesday afternoon. I did clap from my window and so did my neighborhood. So thanks to you and your colleagues for putting up with all these stresses and all these worries in the back of your mind to help us and, you know, all the other medical profession doctors around the world. So um, there is a question from Oli in terms of, do you think the intensive care unit will be given more priority in terms of funding and research? And I'll add to that being a researcher, how about just the general research around vac vaccines and antibodies okay. and uh, immunity, et cetera? Do you think uh, it's about time that the government will provide a bit more support for the um, research groups across, across the world yeah. and within yeah. UK? Yeah, no, I, again, a great question. Um, certainly in terms of intensive care beds, I think it's embarrassed the government um, how few beds we have relative to other countries. And I showed that slide earlier. And so I know in London, there's a big push to double the number of beds uh, that are available. But clearly, it's not just having the beds, you need to have the staff as well. And there's a shortage of trained doctors and nurses and physios and so forth. So there's got to be not just the machines and the beds, but the staff and completely agree with you, Zara. Wouldn't it be nice that the government puts a lot more money into research so that we're better able to understand diseases, not just COVID, but diseases in general and come up with better ways of identifying them early and treating them more effectively. Great. Thank you. Um, 
In terms of the PPEs, uh, I heard myself, and I know some people are asking as well, is, was there really a shortage of PPEs in the hospital, at, at least in University College of London, where you are working? Well, we, we were lucky in that we, we just about managed to cope. Um, we were getting to points where uh, there were, you know, we were running out of uh, gowns and things like that, and we had a shipment from China, and um, Chinese people are generally shorter than people in the UK, and so the arms came up to about here. You know, some of my colleagues are very tall and, you know, the, the sleeves were rather short. And so there was a lot of uh, hairy arm being exposed. <laughs> but you make do with what you have. And obviously, um, hopefully, if there's another surge, we'll be better prepared in terms of masks and gloves and um, hoods and so forth. D did you uh, and your colleagues try to get access to the PPEs that the researchers have in university, just alone in UCL, I know in our labs we have. Was yeah. there an initiative on that? Unfortunately, I think um, the NHS, I heard a figure, and I can't remember the exact figure, but it was something like three million bits of PPE were being used per day. So, you know, it, this was this huge turnover because Every time you went to see a patient, unless they were cohorted together, you had to put on new PPE kit and wearing PPE. You know, the nurses could only do like two hour shifts because it was so uncomfortable. So yeah. you had to have a yeah. huge number of patients, uh, up, sorry, um, um, disposable. So we created a huge uh, um, environmental mountain of uh, PPE that the planet will now have to get rid of. So I'm um, just thank you very much, Mervin. It's time up, time's up. It's one o'clock. But just one quick question around lots of people are asking about the social distancing, the two meter distance apart, the face mask, the ease down of the lockdown on the 4th of July. And the, if you think that COVID-19 is dangerous, why the government is then asking us to ease down on the lockdown? And so what are your views on all these suggestions that the government is giving us in terms of coping with this? Yeah, that, oh, that, that's a horrible question. I'm glad I'm not a politician. On, on the one hand, you've got the doctors quite rightly saying there is a risk that you might get an increase in cases. On the other hand, the economy has suffered really, really, really badly. And that means and you're hearing the news that many people will be made unemployed. Um, and if you can't have a healthy economy, you can't then provide funds for the healthcare service cancer operations, new treatments, lots of other things. So you've got to reach this sensible balancing act between restarting uh, life, but doing it in a, a sensible way and hopefully controlling the, the non-lockdown, the return to normality that we don't get a, a second surge. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Professor Singer, for your time. Thanks to the audience. I heard that there's about over 900 of you tuned in. Thank you very much. I apologize that I could not read everybody's questions because there were so many of you, but I tried to read the ones that are more relevant. And we will receive this session in a recorded format through an email, maybe sometime during next week, with a feedback form. If you could please fill the feedback form and let us know how we did and how can we improve moving forward? And what other topics would you like to hear? Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye from University College London. Bye-bye.